super serious and brooding all the time. He's obviously in his own head. And he's like, I already ate the ice cream because of my old man's memories. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the extra flaccid edition of the Attack on Titan series that I'm doing. This is the episode in which everything that was once hard has now become soft and fleshy. So that's pretty fun. Also, if you notice, my voice sounds a little bit weird. My sinuses and my allergies are going crazy, but I'm actually fine. I'm not actually sick or anything. Just I got a sore throat, clogged up head, and all that great stuff. And as they say in this extra flaccid edition of the Attack on Titan manga series, it's all in the head. So these two chapters, 123 to 124, were actually some pretty awesome chapters, especially 123. So before we get into it, I want to remind you all to leave a like on this video, comment what you thought about chapters 123 and 124, some of your theories on what's going to happen next in Attack on Titan, and as well, hit the subscribe button, ring that bell. Tomorrow, I have a video on Please Don't Tease Me, Miss Nagatoro, and then Friday, I have a Demon Slayer retrospective video. So with that being said, let's get into the video. So we interestingly start this chapter on the boat to Marley. This is something we didn't see in previous chapters and previous episodes of AOT. What I think is so important about this establishing a couple panels here is that Mikasa says that Eren has never changed. She has been able to see that Eren has always been the same person he's always been. It's not the fact that Eren has changed throughout the series. It's actually more so that he's showing more and more different sides of him that he's never shown before. Previously in the series, I thought he had changed somewhat. I thought he had went a different route, a different path. But no, it actually seems like Eren has always been the same person he's always been, always fighting for freedom. It's never change. He doesn't reveal too many sides of him and the sides he does show very unassuming to what his true sides or his true attentions are. In other words, I think Aaron is a guy who lets his actions speak more than his words and plans stuff out inside of his head. This leads to a rather <laughs> hilarious scene where Onion Capone leaves them around Marley and they have like a bunch of pocket change from Azumabito so they can go spend it on whatever they want and experience the culture and the life of the people in Marley and the internment zones. The first thing they see is a car. <laughs> Connie thinks this car is a horse, but Sasha on the other hand thinks it's a cow and Han just like, no, this is a car and then proceeds to wave at the car and say, hey car, this is AOT's Three Stooges moment moment. It's, it's hilarious. It only gets better because Levi tells Onion Capone like, hey, you better tell them to stop or they're going to feed a carrot to a lump of iron. And Onion Capone is like, what? They want, oh my God, they're actually doing it. <laughs> <laughs> they also get to experience for the first time what eating ice cream is like. Ah, uh, poor old Mikasa. Mikasa in this chapter, man, I don't know if she does it to herself more often than Aaron does it to her. It's their first time eating ice cream, so Mikasa's like, hey, Aaron, you want some? And Aaron's just super serious and brooding all the time. He's obviously in his own head. And he's like, I already ate the ice cream because of my old man's memories. And we don't see what Mikasa's reaction is. But if you know any person in real life, their reaction would be like, Oh, dude, this guy's a bummer. Like, I don't want to be around this guy. And poor Mikasa is just always trying to be nice to Eren. Eren, like, I get that the fate of the world is on your shoulders. You have one of the most important titans. But come on. Come on. It's Mikasa. Come on. And speaking of super serious characters, though, Levi catches a pickpocket. What do the people of Marley suggest they do with the pickpocket? They suggest that they hang him in the street and murder him. It shows how vicious the people of Marley are. They're also scared and paranoid people. They they bring up all the rapid blood tests of late to find out if people are subjects of Ymir. They immediately think just because this kid is pickpocketing that this guy is the worst person imaginable. But in reality, he's just a kid. They actually save the kid by making up some story about the kid being Sasha's little brother. But even then, the people of Marley are like, stop with that hogwash. You are lying to us. Stop trying to play us like fools. And I know this like is a fake story and all this and they don't actually know the kid. But if that were to be the reality, they would have still tried to go forth with murdering this child in front of everyone, including his sister. Think about that. So we get a little bit of info about the blood tests that are happening, actually. And it turns out this is all very much paranoia to locate subjects of Ymir and further wash them out, call them, kill them, whatever you want to call it. But even so, talking to Osmo Bito, Hanj and the others want to establish some kind of relationship with these other countries, but it will be difficult. And, and even Osmo Bito cannot offer 
offer her help. That is first shot here is to go out into Marley and announce themselves as who they are and say, hey, we're just people like anybody else. Can we get some protections? But as we'll find out later, it turns out really badly for them. So in the confusion of all of them talking about this, Aaron slips out. Mikasa actually finds Aaron. And it turns out Aaron has wandered into this small village. The kid that pickpocketed them earlier, this is where he lives with his family. And it turns out that their houses were lost to war, just like Mikasa, Aaron, and Armin's were. This, though, leads to a question where Aaron prompts Mikasa and asks, why do you concern yourself with me? And of course, Mikasa is all flustered. She has a you know, blushy face. She can't actually say what she's feeling, probably because she doesn't have her own feelings sorted out for Aaron at this point in time, and says, well, he's family. And like I said earlier, when it comes to Mikasa and Aaron and them being together in some romantic fashion, it seems like it's both of them at different times not reading the room. And I think for Aaron, it's even worse. But even so, like this is a perfect moment where Mikasa could have went, oh, Aaron, it's because I want you. And Aaron would have been like, whoa, you want to smash right here in the streets? And then Mikasa's like, hey, this is the special episode, you know, with the hardening. Yeah, so bad jokes aside. But they end up all getting drunk with this family anyways. Levi walks up, finds them all asleep, except for Sasha, who's vomiting into a bucket. <laughs> <laughs> you at least know that Sasha had a lot of fun. They go to this association meeting. The association that is supposed to protect the subjects of Mir is actually putting all the blame on Paradis to save their own hides. This eventually leads Aaron to walk out on them all together. And this is how Aaron gets separated from them for years and just leaves a note saying that he'll leave everything to Zeke. This leads to a very sad note from Mikasa where she states that she wished she'd chosen a different path that night when Aaron asked her what she meant to him. And you have to think that what would life turn out for everyone if Mikasa just stated her feelings right there? Would they have been some weird happy couple in AOT? I don't think much would have changed at all, but I do think if there was ever a moment, that was probably one of the more perfect moments to expose everything. You're in this whole new world, like you don't know what's going to happen. It's very hopeful because at the end of the day, if everything fails, they would have have each other. And it also makes me wonder how Aaron would react to certain things and how he would make his decisions if he had someone in his life that he loved, especially someone like Mikasa who can kill things, who has a six pack abs, is really cool, can probably outwork me at the gym or really anyone. This leads back to the present where we see what I am going to dub Skelly Aaron. Why Skelly Aaron? Because it's a giant freaking skeleton coming out of Aaron's body. Cause duh, duh. So. The rumbling starts and oh my god, oh my god. When I first read this chapter just now and I saw it happening, I was like, it's finally, oh my god, ah. Uh. I can't wait to see this animated. It was everything I wanted it to be. It's just a bunch of fucking titans destroying shit because they're colossal titans and they're fucking big. It's awesome. And then when you add the scenery of Aaron turning into Skelly Aaron, it's it's epic. It's almost Evangelion-like in its presentation and how it presents its epic scale. It's like on biblical proportions how fucking epic all this stuff is. Armin brings up, why are there so many titans? It should only take a small group from the Shin Gun Chino walls to start the rumbling and perturb everybody. Well, <laughs> up, oh. it turns out Aaron wishes for everybody that's not on Paradis to perish and be exterminated, committing genocide. So remember how when I was talking about committing genocide by euthanasia it was a quite a terrible thing? I think this may be one step bigger than euthanasia. You know, thinking back on it, I think maybe euthanasia would have been like the best option in this case. It seems that Aaron has decided for the genocide route and you know, all respect to him. I understand why he came to those conclusions, but at the same time, maybe there are better options <laughs> than further genocide. And the funny thing when Zeke's like, do you not believe in the plan of euthanasia? And Aaron's like, how could I believe such a silly plan? I believe in my own plan of genocide. Side. It's going to be fun. We're going to kill everything. That's not on Paradis. It really makes you wonder what's going on in Aaron's head. And like I said, maybe 
just maybe, if his girlfriend was Mikasa, all of this would be solved because if my girlfriend was Mikasa, most of my issues would be solved. So if it works for me, it'll probably work for Eren. So before we get into the epic chapter 124, I want to remind you all to leave a like on this video, subscribe, ring the bell, comment down below what you think about the video so far. I also apologize for having allergies. Not much I can do about that. It feels like my head stuffed with marshmallows. So I'm probably going to die by the end of this podcast. So if I do die, make sure to give this video a like, subscribe, and ring the bell. Also, trying to hit 40k subs by the end of May. So if you guys can just go ahead and hit that subscribe button if you haven't already and share it out with your friends on Twitter, would greatly appreciate it. So chapter 140... <laughs> So, chapter 124. It starts off with Gabby and Reiner looking for Falco. Reiner is a very smart guy. He immediately knows that, yeah, he's been taken by the Survey Corps. But what's really interesting is Reiner's hardening went away when the rumbling started. And at this point, I know, like, we're skipping ahead a little bit, but I immediately knew one thing was true, and that Annie was set free, because you know that because Aaron got rid of all of the hardening, well... Annie was coming back and boy oh boy am I happy because Annie is coming back. <laughs> so what are the Survey Corps doing with Falco? Well Connie wants to feed Falco to his mother and Armin brings up you shouldn't be doing this just because of your mom and Connie brings up the fact with Berthold which I think is a good argument against it but still I think Connie is just really hurt and really mad and making a lot of these decisions based off actions that have been dealt to him and he just wants his mother back do I think it's right though no because Falco has proved he's done nothing wrong he's only been protecting Gabby up until this point and yes for them Gabby is an enemy Gabby killed Sasha after all but I do think Falco is completely innocent in all of this. Armin, on the other hand, brings up a lot of great points that if we go through with this, you realize there's going to be more conflict with Reiner because Reiner seems to be very close to Falco. And that is just something I don't think Connie is necessarily getting. I think he's ignoring all of the facts presented in front of him just because he sees an opening to get his mother back and that maybe getting his mother back will heal a lot of the wounds that have been dealt to him over and over. Even though we know that's probably not the right decision to kill an innocent kid just so you can get your mother back. You're trading blood for blood at that point. Then again, maybe that's a better situation to be in because Yelena's world is just, it keeps on tumbling down. She's apparently figured out at this point that, yeah, Zeke's not in control and it's actually Eren that's in control and if Zeke was in control then these titans wouldn't be attacking the fort. She's in a little bit of an emotional state at this point. Come back later. And you guessed it guys, one of my favorite scenes in these two chapters is easily the scene with Gabby because once again it's proving a lot of what I've been saying ever since Gabby showed up and why I think a lot of the Gabby haters are just kind of annoying and that is that Gabby's a great character because she's now redeeming herself. Essentially what happens is runs into Kaya. Kaya is getting cornered just like she did back in her village when her mother was being eaten and was eventually saved by Sasha. And because it's now in a similar situation, a similar resolution happens. Gabby comes to save Kaya, except instead of using a bow, she uses a giant PTRS-41 looking sniper rifle. And she like does this cool thing where she jumps in the air and just plants the barrel in the Titan and just fucking blows it away dude i can't wait to see that animated and in turn the jaegerists find them and are like hey are you the brat that killed sasha and came from marley and kaya's like no my sister we just live in a farm you're mistaken that's all you need to know kaya and gabby's relationship has been mended and not only that but kaya in that moment saw gabby as how she saw sasha so kaya asks gabby that if she's the demon for what she's done and gabby says no it's actually me who is the demon here. I am the one who killed people for praise. That is my demon. And then you see Nicolo come in in the back, which I think is great because Nicolo in many ways keeps the memory of Sasha alive in a lot of people, which is important because he's just a side character at this point. And he says that all people have demons inside of us. And that leads to a lot of really important life lessons for a lot of people. It's not that people have these evil sides to them. It's just that we all have demons. And if we play into those demons, if we play into the voice inside of our head that's telling us to do these things, we're going to fall 
fall down the wrong path and become demons. And it's important to take it day by day and to live a life that you think is wholesome. And if you do end up starting to fall down those paths, you can course correct it before it's too late. That's in a sense what I think this scene was trying to tell us. At least what Nicola was trying to tell us. Another interesting turn of events, Shadis comes back to save the cadets that turned on him, even though they beat the hell out of Shadis. When coming face to face with Titans, they couldn't do crap. But what's sad is that they have to now go and kill all of their comrades. And Pixis is in many ways the last vestige of what the Survey Corps and the military was from season one and season two from the original cast of the series. Though sadly, Flock is still alive. Yeah, that asshole. And when Flock comes walking in, John's like, oh, you're alive. And Flock's like, oh, I'm so glad that you care for my health. And you could just tell, John does not care. John does not want Flock to be alive. Nobody wants Flock to be alive. And what does Flock do? Immediately puts Yelena under arrest. And I'm just like, this asshole literally fought alongside Yelena for this plan. And as soon as the tide turns, it's like, oh no, Yelena is now a criminal. It's like, dude, is there any loyalty? with you? Do you even care about your own comrades? If Aaron told you to kill everyone, would you do it? Yeah, probably because Flock is a bottom feeder. He's a guy that will do anything and be a yes man. It's ridiculous. I can't wait for him to die. So Mr. Browse leads our main cast down to the cellar where they meet with Gabby and the rest of Sasha's family. Turns out Gabby says she doesn't want to fight anymore, which I think that's obvious at this point. She just wants Falco. So she comes to ask where Falco is, which is to the village to be fed to Connie's mother. Gabby begs on her hands and knees for that not to happen. All she wants is Falco and she'll be on her way. She even begs Armin to tell Aaron to turn everybody back into a human to stop all of this but it seems like at this point that she's coming to realize coming to grips that Aaron is doing all of this on his own and that Armin, Mikasa, John, Connie they're not going to be able to stop Aaron but Mikasa asks Gabby where Reiner is. Gabby says Reiner had all of his hardening broken and that he's resting. Armin catches that and says hold up what did you say again and Gabby says Reiner's hardening broke. Armin then realizes that Annie's hardening has broken broke and that she is now free. Oh boy, you guys. Oh boy. Oh freaking boy. I am so freaking. I'm going out of my mind right now. I really, really want to read the next chapter just to see what Annie's doing. It has been so freaking long since I've seen Annie in Attack on Titan. The last time in the manga I saw Annie Attack on Titan, the art style was bad. So now that Annie is broken out and free, what's she going to do? Whose side is she on? Of course, I theorized that Annie is going to be the side of Paradise. And I think that's likely what's going to happen because if she goes to the other side, then she's going to die. Even so, it seems like Annie just wants to go back to her father. So I think her side is going to be on Paradise. I think at this point, they're going to form like a super team of some kind. It seems like that's what it's coming to. Reiner's going to join back up and they're going to have probably peak. Oh God, peak. Uh, they're going to have all of these people come back together. They're going to have Levi. They're going to have everyone and they're going to form a super Avengers team of titans and they're gonna take back everything and be freaking awesome the only person that's left at this point is zeke whose side is he on is he even still alive where is he it's going to be incredibly interesting what's going to happen in the next chapters of attack on titan oh my god and he's back oh my god the thought of them all forming together Oh, this is crazy. Either way, if you guys enjoyed this video, uh, this was an hour long recording session because I can barely breathe, but I forced this video out anyways because I am excited for Attack on Titan. I potentially made my cold worse than it actually is just because these chapters were so freaking amazing. So thank you all for watching the video. If you haven't, like the video, subscribe or ring the bell, comment down below what do you think Annie's role is going to be in, what do you think about my theories, can't wait for the next chapter everyone. Thanks for watching. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.